So a bit of a change of pace, uh, more on the academic proof of concept side, a bit far away from uh, mass production and everything. But, but we've been developing these so-called organic electrochemical transistors for a, a variety of biological interfacing applications, mostly on the brain in our group. But So I'll, I'll focus on that today. But, but there are a lot of applications here that, that we have been pursuing. Um, and I think epilepsy is, is one good example that really highlights why we focus on the brain and why there, there's interest to develop new technologies, new sensors that can uh, greatly enhance the current technology. So epilepsy is a disease that affects some 1% of the world population, and about 30% of these patients ha do not respond to conventional drug treatments. So <clears throat> recording neural activity is an important part of not only diagnosis, but it's also increasingly being incorporated into various therapeutic strategies. But in that context, there's this real desire to improve electrode performance, to enhance the ability to diagnose this disease and to intervene to treat it. But also, uh, to, we are, there's also a motivation to make these recording devices ever less invasive. So in that context, the idea of using electrodes instead of transistors for sensing has been around for some time. But I'll say in the clinic today, all the recording devices for recording uh, neurological activity, are, they're basically electrodes that either are on the skin or on the brain or into the brain. And the way these devices work in a very simple way, you can imagine it there. So the top is illustrating uh, what's happening with the electrode. So you have your, let's point it, let's go here. We have, imagine my electrode is here trying to sense some activity in the brain. So the electrode is going to pick up this information with the source, but also some noise. And then there's going to be a line that's transmitting this source and noise to some amplification device. Along the way, it's going to pick up some additional noise from the line. And then it's going to be amplified, and that's going to go to some external recording software. So now our signal-to-noise ratio, you have to also factor in, in this amplified noise from the, the transmission line. Now with the transistor, you could potentially do your amplification directly at the source. So now you effectively not amplifying this uh, noise from the line. And have it, uh, consequently, you, you'll ideally have a higher signal-to-noise ratio. Um, so this idea of using transistors for recording neural activity has been around for, for some time as well. For instance, uh, over 10 years ago, there, there was a group that was culturing neural cells on top of silicon-based transistors. And they found that, indeed, you can get better signal-to-noise ratio and, and really get very nice neural recordings. But kind of. Oops. But where we've come in and, and what we've been focusing on is kind of improving this transistor concept. And, and we believe this so-called organic transistor, organic electrochemical transistor, excuse me, offers significant advantages when it comes to biological interfacing. So this is a cartoon of the basic device structure. It, it's still a three-terminal device. You have a gate electrode, you have a source and a drain. In between source and drain, we typically have a mixed conducting polymer such as P.PSS. So I say mixed conducting because it's transporting not only holes in electrons, but also ions. And in between gate and the, the channel, we have an electrolyte. So in biology, you're always dealing with salt water, so electrolyte. So it's important to have a device that's uh, going to work in this type of environment. And note that there's no insulator between the channel and the electrolyte. And what this enables, then, is for these uh, the ions in the electrolyte go into the full bulk of the material, and this significantly enhances the sensitivity. So here's kind of a cartoon illustrating different uh, device concepts when it comes to transistors. So if you consider a normal FET, you would say have a gate electrode, <coughs> where this field effect is primarily going to be determined by the surface area of the dielectric. And there are also electrolyte-gated FETs. Basically, you get rid of the dielectric, and you have an electrolyte, the interface with your channel here, and again, the uh, surface area of this interface between the channel and the electrolyte is going to determine where this field effect is uh, exhibited. In contrast, in the OECT, because we have a mixed conducting material, this electrolyte is actually able to drive ions to the whole bulk of the material. So it's actually a bulk field effect. And in fact, you, you could argue that organic uh, electrochemical transistor is a bit of a misnomer because there's no electrochemistry happening here. It's really just a bulk field effect. And then there are some interesting uh, consequences of this. We've done a number of experiments to convince ourselves and others that that's really what's happening here, this idea of this bulk field effect. One of, one of the primary examples was measuring capacitance of the conducting channel. So in the case for this material, P.PSS, which is kind of our fruit fly of, of this uh, area of investigation. 
So we need the capacitance as a function of volume. We see the capacitance goes directly with volume. So it's really a volumetric capacitance. So then consequently, we see we have, compared to the double layer capacitance of a film with the same dimensions, you have about 100 times increase in your capa effective capacitance. And now when you consider the transfer transistor performance, so we put this material in an OECT, we can measure drain current a function of gate voltage, we see a very nice transconductance. So an important parameter here is how easily the gate voltage change, like a small change in gate voltage is a big change in the drain current. And you can measure this. This is typically called the transconductance in green here, so just the derivative of this curve. So now effectively our transconductance for this geometry of device is about 100 times greater than what you have it when a silicon transistor. And it's all because of this, this bulk effect, the ions penetrating in the full film. Now, when you think in the big picture, one thing to consider is we are working in relatively lower frequencies because we're talking about ions going to the full, full bulk of the film. So if you're looking at megahertz type applications, this is not the right device. But when it comes to biology, where most everything of interest is really happening in sub few hertz up to kilohertz, OECTs really have a big advantage over other transistors such as OFETs. So <clears throat> to illustrate that, one, one thing we, we've recently shown is that we can fabricate these organic electronic uh, OECTs onto flexible substrates such as perylene and to make uh, devices that can conformally coat the surface of the brain. And then we can compare recordings of electrical activity from the OECT, so the transistor, versus a conventional electrode of similar dimensions. And we see, in fact, so this is recordings of neural activity on the surface of the brain. And we see almost double increase in the signal to noise ratio from the transistor, which again is important for diagnosis. It's important for eventually incorporating these devices into brain machine interfaces. And what's also very nice about the, this finding is, so now if we compare our transistor recording on the surface of the brain, the surface electrode, and also comparing it to a depth electrode, so an electrode that's actually penetrating into the brain, so a more invasive device, we can see basically, if you look at the frequency space of this recording, you can see basically the, the signal from the transistor is very similar to the depth electrode, which is really suggesting that these devices potentially could provide the same information as a significantly more invasive device. So this is some nice proof of concept work. And since then, we've been really pushing forward on the materials and device physics side to improve, improve the devices a bit more and, and ultimately make this not just an academic uh, exercise, but something that eventually could be scaled up into something useful. So to that end, we've done a number of studies that have really highlighted that these devices are primarily interested in balancing this electronic and ionic transport. So in a study looking at this P-dot PSS material, which is a polymer that's mixed, so P-dot is a P-type hole conducting material, PSS is a polyelectrolyte, and the PSS dopes P-dot. And by processing this material with a coal solvent, we can actually tune slightly the uh, hole conductivity and also the, the ion conductivity. So here I'm showing in blue a measurement of hole conductivity and in red ion conductivity. You see a little bit of this co-solvent ethylene glycol, we see a big increase in hole conductivity. What's happening is you're changing the, the film formation properties of this film, and you're having denser packing of these p-dot uh, domains. They're richer in p-dot, and this is better for hole transport. But it has a negative effect on the ion conductivity. So as we add more and more ethylene glycol, we see the ion conductivity is going down. Consequently, we see that there's actually a very narrow window where now we're considering this peak transconductance, so how well does this device transduce our signal? We have a pretty narrow processing window to, to balance these two effects. Kind of pushing further in this concept of balancing uh, electrical transport and ionic transport, we've developed a model, basically, that <clears throat> tells us the most important parameter in these devices is the product of the mobility, so the electronic mobility, and the volumetric capacitance. So this is going back to how much ions can you put in the material. And now we've looked at a, a growing library of materials. We're plotting uh, hole mobility as a function of the um, volumetric capacitance. And the ideal material would be pushing up in this direction. Now, as I mentioned, this material P.PSS already a few times. This is where we've been working with mostly. But we, we have recently developed a few other materials. And there's a lot of work that has been done in the past in FETs, et cetera, to understand how you go from here up to here. I mean, think 
hole transport and electron transport and conducting polymers is, has been studied for some time. But this concept of volumetric capacitance and what that is and how you would tune that is a little bit new. So we wanted to develop a conceptual model to understand how I could take this material over, sliding over on the scale and how these materials ended up where they are and how to push this even further. So to that end, we, we imagine that okay, you can, if you have a simple double layer capacitance, the situation is a bit like this. You have a planar electrode. Say if this is some carbon-based electrode, this double layer capacitance is going to be on the order of a few farads per centimeter squared. Now in our conducting polymer, where we have ions penetrating the full bulk of the film, we actually imagine this as many double layer capacitances. Each of these interfaces is just the same as that electrode here. So we can look at the bulk of the film as actually many capacitors in parallel. And some back of the envelope calculations, we can find, okay, so then our, if this is true, our volumetric capacitance should be roughly proportional to the double layer capacitance divided by the average difference distance between sites, so the kind of the site density within the material. And kind of following along these lines, we, we find if, if we do these calculations with the numbers we, know, we have based on other experimental measures for the materials we've looked at, actually we recover quite nicely, or predict quite nicely, the volumetric capacitance that, that we're measuring experimentally. So what this insight tells us is that to increase volumetric capacitance, one promising route is to make ever denser polymers, so increase the site density of these materials. And now going back to our chart, we, we can actually see that that's what really has happened here. So now if we compare P dot PSS, which is up here, which I told you is a P-type material that's doped by this polyelectrolyte PSS. Now, if we replace PSS with just the monomer unit of that, so a small molecule that's also, uh, it's also doping the material, but effectively is taking less space within the whole bulk of the film, so therefore you can have more P dot and a higher site density, we see our volumetric capacitance increases greatly. Furthermore, now if we go another concept, just having a P-type material with hydrophilic side chains, we can have a similar effect. Um, where we basically increase the site density just by molecular engineering. And since it's P-type and we've kind of built on previous lessons from uh, organic transport and transistors, we've been able to maintain the uh, high uh, hole mobility there. But certainly uh, important for this material, notice these side chains here. If we make a similar material, but instead of uh, these hydrophilic uh, side chains, we have hydrophobic side chains, these alkyl groups, then the kind of cartoon picture would look something like this, where ions are not going to penetrate into the bulk of the film. This film is not wanting to take up water, so it's not swelling. Ions aren't going to go in. Contrast here, and then ions are going to penetrate through the whole film. And now you can measure the capacitance for these two materials. And if you compare them, so the material that's with these hydrophilic side chains is taking up ions is significantly higher capacitance than this material that's not taking up those ions. And in fact, the capacitance that we measure for this material is very similar to what you would get with just a bare metal electrode. So with that said, I'll just go ahead and conclude by, by kind of summarizing the, the basic findings here. Basically, we've been developing these organic electrochemical transistors, which are great for amplifying your, your measure, your, what you're measuring in the biological setting. We've demonstrated they yield a better signal-to-noise ratio. And they allow you to look deeper into the brain, which ultimately we're hoping can lead to less and ever less invasive implants. We've noted that PDF PSS is a rather well-performing material, but we can prove this for further by understanding that ultimately for OECT performance, we want to optimize uh, sorry, electronic carrier mobility as well as volumetric capacitance. And one promising strategy so far has been developing pi-conjugated backbone materials with hydrophilic side chains. I'll just acknowledge a number of people that have contributed to this work, in particular George, who put all this together, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions, yes. Alexia Kulet, Newcastle Hi. University. Very Hi. interesting. I, I somehow see this uh, kind of paradigm here shift from uh, basically taking this from input signal Mm -hmm. kind of from informational into more something that gives you energy. So it's more like a battery to me, this volumetric capacitance. Than, so it gives me 
energetic signal effectively together with maybe some information also informational in terms of uh, as you said the response is not very on, on very high frequency but uh, probably if you need to sample things mm -hmm. and sample energy rather with the signal itself and you don't care really about very high frequency of sampling so this is probably completely different I'm not sure what because I don't I'm not <laughs> expert in, you know in materials and devices, but volumetric capacitance seems to me more like a kind of some sort of battery which gives you uh, shots of uh, values because you, 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 you give current there. It's not voltage, that it's current there essentially. Right, so yeah, yeah. I, I it, do you think that this signal could integrate it? So it basically you move from the domain of amplifying to the domain of integrate, and then you can actually use it. Uh, both as a power source and, uh, as well as information source. Uh, I mean, that's not something I've thought about directly, but I would say uh, I think there are definitely are analogies between battery and volumetric capacitance concept. Exactly. I'm not sure what you mean by energy source. I mean, it's, okay, it has a capacitor. Yeah, it has high capacity. Yeah, yeah, okay. You can see something if you store it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be a different approach from, from transducing a signal, but yeah. I think they're interesting. Yeah. yeah. Good to think about that line. Up there, one question. So, yeah, I'm Ahmed Mutasman again. So, I have a couple of questions, basically. The first one is related to the lifetime. Do you consider the lifetime for this transistor? And the second one is about the leakage. How was the leakage for the transistor? So, yeah, we, we've done some studies on lifetime, uh, you know, measuring thousands of cycles. They, they can be fairly stable in that context. I think when you think long term, how, what what lifetime you need is a matter of the application, whether you have some disposable sensor or something that's implanted. Probably for an implantable device that's going to be yeah, left as an implant, you would want a long lifetime. But there are a lot of applications clinically even where you're implanting for the order of a few hours, in which case your lifetime is a bit shorter. Leakage current is an interesting question. That's actually something where we're looking into quite a bit now, understanding leakage current and also like intrinsic noise within the devices. That's a kind of interesting <laughs> avenue of research, let's say, yeah. Well, let's thank Chris again. Great. Thank you.